Who are you guys? So are you guys, actually, why are you guys here? Get a workout. Okay, you will. So I'm going to make an assumption that most of you are here to learn something. Can you say yes? yes. Great. So um, on that assumption, you're here to learn something, and I'm going to make another assumption that that's going to help you get more of the good life. You like that idea? So I want you to get a little involved in it. Can you stand up, please? You said you wanted to work it. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do two things. When I asked you how you are, was the response like unbelie- unbelievably earth-shattering wonderful? Right? You are in charge of brands, cults, marketing. Do you think your response would motivate everyone out in the rest of the world? Okay, we'll just say no. <laughs> but in about 30 seconds, you're going to change all that. Are you with me? Say yes. Yeah. Oh, that was so much better. That was so much better. In fact, you're going to do something at the end of it, and I'm going to say, now, praise the person beside you, and you're going to shake hands with the person beside you and tell them what a great job they did, because that's part of what we do. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, when I ask you how you are, I want you to say 10. But I want you to kind of do it like this. I'm going to have you ask me in a second. The person controlling the mic, can you turn it off for a second? Can you ask me? I'm a 10! Did you hear me? Was there any doubt in your mind that I was serious about being a 10? Ask me again. I'm a 10. So you don't have to scream it. You just have to mean it. So what I'm going to ask you in a second is from every part of your core, from these muscles that control your diaphragm, I want you to let it out. When I ask you on a scale of 1 to 10, I want you to go, I'm a 10. Are you guys ready? Remember what you do. You market. You brand. Remember? You want everyone to know how great you are. On a scale of 1 to 10, what are you? Oh, that was so much better. Can you actually congratulate the person beside you? Now, that was your first time, right? I didn't say sit down. You know, I work you out. I'm your trainer. Okay. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, we're going to do it again. On a scale of 1 to 10, what are you? Does that feel even better? On a scale of 1 to 10, what are you? Think about how your endomorphins are getting better. On a scale of 1 to 10, what are you? Are you feeling better? Okay. So, you take this, take one of your arms, take the right one. And when you say 10, I want you to go like this. Are you with me? One arm, like this. You can all do this. Say yes? Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm a... Oh, you're so good! Try it again. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm a... You're fantastic. Sit down. What we just did is what we do at Good Life with everyone that's associated with the company, all 13,000. We have to have the people that look after the members believing that they can make a difference in people's lives. Our brand is to help people believe in themselves to get the good life. I'll say it again. Our brand is to help people believe in themselves to get the good life. To help them believe in themselves, our staff have to believe in themselves too. So on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think they have to be? If you run around through the world thinking you're a 10, things start to get better. If you're doing a workout and you believe you're a 10, you'll work out a little harder. If you go out on a date and you believe you're a 10, you'll have a better time. (laughs) You get the point, right? So that's the underlying culture of good life is to help people become successful. Now, when you normally think of a fitness club, I'll bet you think of somebody with a ripped body and huge big muscles and some, you know, unbelievably great shape bodybuilding type of person. That's not what we are. We have people in great shape. 
But what our company is, what our culture is, what our brand is, is all about caring. We have seven core values, but the number one is caring. That's how the company started, and how we started is exactly what we do now. We care about not just how you look, but how you feel inside. We know that if you look after your body, it looks after your mental state, and it looks after your soul. That's what we do. So this clip is a compilation of a couple of our commercials, and it'll give you an idea. That's what I mean. It's about believing in your own capabilities. Everybody has a different version of what the good life is. We simply want you to believe you can get it. Is this effective? Is this like total different from all other fitness clubs attitude? Effective. That on the left is my very first club. And I took it over from a guy who had quite a bit of money didn't get this. So he was selling memberships kind of the way Chris said, based on pricing. And I came in and I came, decided that I would actually find out what people needed. And once I found out what they needed, I would put their training program in that direction. I wouldn't tell them what to do. I wouldn't say, hey, I got big biceps. That was easy because I didn't have big biceps. But I would say, hey, you know, it's not about what I am. It's about what you need. So we started that way. This very first club you know, I'd ask the guy lots of questions. I was training on the, master, on a, on the national rowing team, and I'd uh, taken uh, my master's in exercise physiology. And uh, I'd ask the guy all these questions about how to run the club. And one day he says to me, if you're so interested in this, why don't you buy this club? I said, well, I don't have a lot of money. He says, well, come back and we'll talk about it. So I went into my rowing practice, brought back a case of beer, because I find beer is a very good negotiating tool. <laughs> so I brought back the beer, and uh, we drank all the beer, and I opened the club the next morning as the owner. You know. So, as you can bet, I had a big IOU and lots of bills to pay. And where I got this idea that you have to believe in yourself happened all in the first two or three weeks at this place. Is people would come with smoking. This is 1979. People would come in smoking cigarettes. And, you know, give you an idea... If you have um, non-smoking lungs, they're red. They're brilliantly red. If you smoke, they're black. And so I told people they couldn't smoke. And people said, you're crazy. And people quit the club. Now, did I tell you I didn't have any money? So people quit the club because I wouldn't let them smoke. 1979, about 80% of the population smoked back then. And I said, you can't smoke. It was radical. You know, I was willing to sacrifice a member. Since then, I've had at least a thousand people either write me or tell me in person, you saved my life. And then we had this other attitude going on in the club. There was a football team that worked out in the club, and one of the lead guys in the football team had worked as a bouncer at a local bar in London, Ontario, where this all happened, that I also worked at. And I happened to know that the guy was crazy, off the wall crazy. 
And when he was doing his biceps exercise with about seven guys around him, he'd be going, shit, 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 shit. And I'd be going, don't, 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 don't. Because I wanted to have a certain culture in my club. But this is how everybody trained. Every macho person out there was swearing and grunting and groaning. I said, my club's not going to be like that. We're going to have a club where normal people can come. <laughs> what a concept, eh? And, but back in 1979, it was different. This club was all men, by the way, too. I changed that. I like girls, so I brought them in. Right? <laughs> so he was swearing away. And I had warned him. I said, if you do that, you can't stay here. But he says, Patch, I need to do that to get a real good pump, to really get in great shape. I said, but you can't do that. You can train without swearing. He says, no, I can't. I said, then you can't be a member. And now I had an office that was about this big. It was a 2,000 square foot little club. Most of my change rooms, each change room is bigger than that now. It's this big. So I'm standing beside him. And I'm thinking, I'm about to die. I said, you can't, you have to leave. I'll give you back your money. He says, I was going to buy a membership for my brother today. And I'm going, oh my God, I could have paid the rent. He says, no. And then three of his buddies came back and asked for their money too. And I had to go to the landlord for the next two months and beg for rent relief. And I couldn't pay myself. I had to sell my first house. I sold five houses as I grew the company. I just get enough money to buy a house and I'd want to open another club to sell it. But I had to go into rent relief. I had to sell my house because at that decision not to let people swear my club. It was the most important decision I ever made. It created a culture. This, I said, this is what it is. We're going to care for all the people that are the silent majority. Like the 95% of people that don't swear when they work out. Right? Maybe the 98%, right? So that was our first club. We turned that around. This is what our average club looks like now. We have 350 clubs. And out of 350 clubs, 200 of them are clubs I took from someone else and changed the culture. And sometimes we take over cultures that are bodybuilding cultures and we change that culture. Because that's what the brand is. It's a place where everybody can get in shape, not a select few. That's risk-taking. It's also about having an unreasonable belief in doing the right thing. So the very first thing I did with you was about belief, believing in yourself, right? I had this unreasonable belief that I could change the world by actually paying attention to people's needs. And it seems to be working so far. Now, my wife will tell you that I'm just unreasonable in general. You know, I asked her out on a dinner date for eight months. Right? So sometimes you have to have an unreasonable belief in what you want. And when sometimes people say to me, well, you miss some of the market, you miss those bodybuilders, or you miss those guys that would swear, I'd say, you know, I want a certain part of the market. I want people that get what I'm giving. And that market is really big. You know, and um, they were talking about at Sport Check yesterday how he wanted this certain part of the market, right? Cirque du Soleil wanted this certain part of the market. So I actually was doing the same thing in 1979. We're still doing it. We're still saying this is what we stand for. And just so you know, I didn't get anyone saying this was a good idea. My professors at university said it would be a total failure. I couldn't get any money from the bank because they said this was a crazy idea. I actually couldn't get money from the bank for five years. I survived and built my new clubs off the snow plowing business I had started in university. So you have to believe in what you can do. And when people tell you, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that, do not let that stop you. Think about the things you can do. Focus on the things you can do. And I'm going to give you a little background on my personal history that set me up for this kind of success. And I call them my three A's. And the first one was an accident I had two weeks into university. I was driving a motorcycle kind of fast. Anybody here on a motorcycle? You know anybody who drives a motorcycle slow? No. So, and in 19, I'm driving it fast. And I have this uh, accident where, you know, someone cuts me off. Next thing I know, I'm on the ground. The motorcycle's on me. I throw the motorcycle off, and then I can't move for hours. I experienced what it was like to be paralyzed. It wasn't permanent, thank God, but it was severely scary. 
And then they, you know, the doctors come in and they're figuring out what's wrong with me. And it turned out I just busted this half of my body. And I was down like this. My arm was hanging off. My chest muscles were hanging off. Deltoid was bicep. It was all screwed up. And um, in fact, this arm still doesn't go straight. And long story short, they, I qualify for disability. They, think, they say I'm going to be permanently disabled. And I go to the physio clinic at the university where I am to start you know, doing what I can to get better. And they go, in, they go in there twice a week, work out, and do what they say. And I'm in there my twice a week, and I'm in there, and there's all these incredible athletes training using the same equipment that I use, but they use them to train for the Olympic Games. And I'm beside this woman who's doing this certain exercise called the super pullover like 200 times in a row. And I'm beside her, and I'm trying to get my arm to go up the wall and go, itsy bitsy little spider, feeling like a suck. Right? And she's like just driving it. And she was on the rowing team. It was my first concept of what rowing was. And I'm going up like this, itsy bitsy little spider. And I went over to the trainer and I said, the physiotherapist trainer, I said, if I came in more often, would it make a difference? And he looked at me like I was nuts, and he said, well, of course, if you came more often, it would make a difference. And that was a lesson I learned later in my business, was people don't know what it takes to get in shape. I'd played lots of sports before this, but I didn't know that I should come more often than twice a week. So I started coming twice a day, and I started coming twice a day for two hours a day. And finally, I got off the disabled list. And then I started rowing to build my body back up and ended up winning about five Canadian rowing championships after that happened. And rowing were the people that told me to go and work out at this particular fitness club. And if I hadn't had the accident, I wouldn't have gone to the fitness club. If I hadn't gone to the fitness club, I wouldn't be here, getting the, you know, the free margaritas, right? <laughs> so the accident was one of the best things that ever happened to me, and it led to me starting up this fitness club. And so everything was going great. I had about five fitness clubs. I was about 32 years old, and I was competing in the World Masters Rowing Championships. Won a whole bunch of medals. I went up to my cottage the day after to relax and recover. I woke up in the morning, and I couldn't move. Couldn't move at all. And, and my body was just like aching. And I tried to get up, and it took me like an hour to get to the washroom. I really had to go by then. Right? And I had taken on what they call instant onset arthritis. And which I still have, and very severe. And I had to learn to adapt my diet and had to learn to adapt a whole bunch of things. And I, never, I couldn't sleep at the time from the pain. And so I had to get all my staff to do the things that I thought I had to do. And it turned out they were way smarter than me. And so that developed the management in the company that allowed us to grow, where I could focus on vision and thinking about what to do next. And the other thing that happened is we developed empathy. Because all of a sudden, I understood what it was like to be old. Because for two years, you know, I had to leave the keys in the car because I couldn't, turn, put, couldn't put the keys in. I remember standing by doors for people to open the door because I couldn't turn the handle. So I all of a sudden got what it was like to have a heart attack, to have an injury. And the company started to rock it because we listened to people and we really found out what caring was. And I thought that was enough. I thought I'd had enough life lessons. And my first daughter was born, and she turned out to be autistic. So for you people that don't know what autism is, when you're born, you have all these brain cells that are going on in your head, and as you get older, brain cells die off, and you get highways of information, and you get more effective. Instead of being a little child looking up, kind of spacey, well, autistic people, that information thing doesn't seem to happen the same way. An autistic person tends to get all the information coming in all the time. So if they were sitting in this room, they could hear the fans, they could see all the rays of the light that you can't see anymore. They can hear different people breathing. It becomes overwhelming. It becomes a whole bunch of noise. It's kind of like being in a rock concert all the time with strobe lights and things pounding. And then autistic people, only thing they can do is withdraw. And then withdraw into their head. And they might do self-abusive behavior like biting their hand or hitting their head against the wall because that centers things so that all this noise doesn't come in. And here I'm with my autistic daughter, and I'm trying to think how to help her because I can't do it myself, right? How do I help her? And what I had to learn was I had to love her just the way she was. 
And what I had to learn was to appreciate every single thing she could do. And I had to be happy with each thing sh she did. And I'd carry this over to work. And the other thing about autistic people is they don't really get right and they don't really get wrong. They get what you pay attention to. So if they're doing unusual behavior, let's say throwing the food all over the place, and you go, oh, don't throw the food all over. Guess what they do more? They throw the food around more. They might even throw it at you. I've had that happen a few times. So if you pay attention to the behavior that you don't want, it happens more and more. The only way to really help a severely autistic person get better is to pay attention to the things you want and ignore the things you don't want. And so with my daughter that I homeschool, I had to do that, pay attention to what I want at all the time. So what happened is I had to do that at work too. Little things that we have like every month, we have a meeting at the first of the month that celebrates all the things that went right last month. And this is how our brand has gotten stronger. We celebrate what people do right. One more rep, way to go, just like I did with you guys. You see these pictures? That's not us. This is us. Good enough is good enough. We want to find out what you want, when you want it, and then celebrate and just keep you doing it on a regular basis. This is what we celebrate. Normal people doing extraordinary things. Anyone can have the good life. What's happened today? We've gone from one little club to 350 clubs in Canada. We're the fourth largest group of clubs in the world, all based on this cult, all based on this type of branding. Two. For the Americans, Rick Mercer is an iconic a of guy. Crude oil threatens Canadian jobs. Despite record car and truck sales, there is still too much oil. But there is one way to eliminate the glut. For just $5, Canada's petroleum producers will fill your Good Life Fitness bag with oil. Thanks. No, thank you. Because according to census figures, Canada now has more Good Life Fitness bags than people. Enough red bags to absorb excess crude supply from Calgary to Kuwait. That's great. But now I need another bag to go to the gym. You'll find a wide selection of Good Life bags in the lost and found of any transit system. I don't have time to visit a lost and found for another Good Life bag. Have you looked inside your current Good Life bag? Oh, there's two more in here. Help address two gluts at once. Fill your Good Life bags with oil. Wow, where'd you get all the bags? Furnace guy said they were clogging my ducts. By the way, we did not pay for that. So what's next for Good Life? We plan to grow to 1,000 clubs in Canada, 500 Good Lifes and 500 Fit for Lesses, our, our budget brand. And I'm going to show you why, because you're going to be part of it. Stand up, please. And if you really want to have some excitement, stand in your chair. I want you to imagine that you've been working for six months in northern Canada. It's freezing up there, 40 below. And you finally get to go down on a trip down to Mexico. And you're on the plane, you're sitting on the plane at 6 o'clock in the morning, you're about to go down, and the snow blows in, and you have to wait another hour, and the snow blows in, you have to wait another hour, and they deep ice it and all that kind of stuff. But finally you take off and you go down to Mexico. But the food has gone bad while you were waiting. They run out of water because, I for oh, I forgot to tell you, you were watching hockey last night, you drank a lot of beer, you're a little hungover. Right? So you drank all the water too. So you got about four hours, no water, you get down to Mexico. You get down to Mexico, they don't know you're coming. They don't know what to do. The buses have left. They bring the buses back. They say, it's going to take about two hours. And they're thinking, what do I do to keep these people satisfied? We can't give them any water. They say they need water because in Mexico, you drink the water, you get sick, right? So the Patron tequila guys <laughs> sent in a whole bunch of tequila. We put it in big vats, and we made up a bunch of margaritas, right? And you come in, and as soon as you get off the plane, we hand you a big margarita. Just actually, just take it in your right hand. Just take that margarita. Look at it. Go boom. You walk about 10 feet, there's another margarita. You know, Rosie's handing it to you. Go, boom! Oh, it tastes good, doesn't it? You walk into the airplane hangar place, and there's a band in their plane. And they got this good music on, and they say, have a margarita. And you go, what the hell? Have another margarita. Go, boom! And they say, we're going to do the margarita dance. You're going to do the margarita dance. But you need one more margarita. Reach out, take another margarita. 
go boom. Now, just for your own information, you've been out of the plane for five minutes. You've had four margaritas, 150 proof. You're a little drunk already, right? And they say, put your hands up like this. We're going to do the margarita dance. Now, wiggle your fingers, okay? That's the salt in the glass. That encourages you to drink. Now, move your hips. The music's starting. Move your hips. Get those hips moving. You guys can do this. Move those hips. Now, repeat after me. Don't even think about it. Just say, I'm a margarita, baby. I'm a margarita, baby. I'm a margarita, baby. I'm a 10. Now, here's a new learning. You do, I'm a 10, like this. Try it. Go, I'm a 10. Then go, I'm sexy. I'm smart. I'm, smart. I'm strong. I'm you guys are unbelievable. I think the alcohol's working. Okay, ready. Put your hands up there. Move those hips around, just like you will tonight. Say, I'm margarita, baby. I'm margarita, baby. I'm margarita, baby. I'm a 10. I'm sexy. I'm smart. I'm strong. One more time. I'm a 10. I'm sexy. I'm smart. I'm strong. And that's how you get a cult brand. Thank you very much.